Here we go. Man, we're off and running. All right. Uh, the next exam, we have three. It's going to be on chapter five only, just gases. That is. Oh. Hi. Okay. Let me mark you to present. I'm at work, so I'm going to have to turn off my camera. Say again. I'm at work, so I'm going to have to turn off my camera. Oh. But I'm here. I'm listening, but I have, just have to turn the camera off because you can't see inside the lab. Okay. Can you still see me? Yeah, I'll still be able to see you. You just can't see me. Good. All right. That's, that's okay. <clears throat> so this chapter, we're going to discuss gases. You'll notice that the, the slide set that goes with this chapter is completely different from any of the others. Because this one was created many moons ago, and it was just too good to throw away, so I kept it instead of using the publisher's version. <clears throat> so, what do we know about gases? Well, we know that a, a gas is one of the three phases that we're really interested in, in addition to liquids and solids. Uh, gases, of course, um, require an enclosed vessel. If they expand the filled vessel, they take the shape of the vessel. And uh, they do that because they can't, there's not, the forces are not strong enough to hold the, each other together, the molecules in a gas. They, they're pretty much independent particles. And so when you, when you put them in a container, um, they say, that's great, more space. You just, you just expand out. Because it doesn't matter what your, your neighbor's doing. Okay. These are some things that we do know about gas particles. Atoms, molecules. Uh, atoms can be gases, like the normal gases. Yep. Um, molecules can be gases, like uh, carbon dioxide. It's a gas, and it's a molecule. But they're moving very fast. And at the, at the end of this set, we're going to calculate how fast air molecules are moving on the average. And, and you'll see it's extremely fast. You don't really think about it. Right? Because when they smack into your face, there's not enough of them for you to sense the, the feeling. You can sense the feeling if you do that. Anytime you put two or more gases together, they always form a homogeneous mixture every time. Another name for that is solution. Right? Two or more gases together makes a solution. The reason they do that, of course, is because there's plenty of room for everybody. The distance between uh, molecules in a gas compared to the size of the molecule is enormous. It's a huge difference, big distance in there. So you can just put as many gases as you want in there. There's room for everybody. However, gases do possess mass. Right? And if you uh, if you continue in uh, Chem 102 and 104, we're going to do the last lab of the semester, we're going to weigh a gas on the way to finding the molecular the molar mass of that gas. Okay. <clears throat> we have to assume <coughs> that their motion is random. Because there are too many of them. Even though there's lots of space between them, just a, a small sample of air like that has billions of, mole, of uh, molecules in it, or atoms, diatomic molecules, nitrogen and oxygen mostly. So the gas does, each particle does have mass, and that's sort of a corollary from this one. What about this? I was talking about random motion, wasn't I? I just 
brain part. <laughs> okay, so we assume that all the gases have random motion because we can't track each one of them. They're just too many. No supercomputer or combination of supercomputers can track every molecule in space and determine its trajectory. Right? Once, if they're acting like billiard balls, then when they smack into each other, how fast they meet and the angle that they meet, you can calculate which direction they're going afterwards. <clears throat> but that's one by one. We don't have enough processing power to do the whole thing. So we assume that they're Okay, I see you. I marked you present. So we just assume that their motion is random, which means if we're going to say anything about uh, molecules, we need a large number of them. That's no problem. There's lots of molecules in a small sample. So we're going to look at the different gas laws. We're going to start with laws. Right? And we're going to take it in roughly chronological order. Uh, gases were the, the first uh, chemicals that uh, physicists and chemists were investigating back in the uh, mid 17th century. They started looking at gases and describing their behavior. And they described their behavior with laws. And we get a, a formula for each one. It's a mathematical description. We're going to talk about that. <coughs> <coughs> We're going to define what an ideal gas is and how it behaves. Uh, simply because if we are able to describe all gases in similar terms, then when we see a difference between two gases, um, we can factor out their similarities and find out what the differences are. Right? So we define an ideal gas, and then we look for uh, deviations from ideal behavior. Um, uh, we'll talk about this, the ideal gas equation later. Uh, why are we interested in gases? Well, for one thing, if we can breathe air, we'll be in deep trouble. Air contains primarily uh, two gases, nitrogen, which we can't use, sort of a filler. And it composes about 79% of the air. About 20% of the air is oxygen. That's the one word that we know. Plants, the other way around, heterotrophs like us. <clears throat> um, need oxygen. Plants, their food is carbon dioxide. Right? So when they tell you carbon dioxide bad, you say, go away, send them a tree somewhere in the bottom. Because plants need CO2. In fact, with CO2 rising, productivity of plants has been shown in experiments, productivity of plants increases. They have more CO2 at their disposal. Uh, that and temperature. As temperature increases, productivity increases. I mean, think about it. Where do all those coal fields come from? I mean, some of them you can stand up in, right? They've been compacted, so they have to start out really thick and get compacted. Where they come from? They have plants. And those coal fields are just, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. Some of them we haven't even found yet. So at one time in the Earth's history, it was extremely productive. It was had high CO2, and the plants were just cranking out biomass. So much so that there, there weren't enough animals around to eat it all. So when they died, they just fell over, and eventually got covered in sediment, compacted, and now we have coal. <clears throat> So, like I said, it's necessary for life, both plants and animals. There are a few microbes that can get along without it, right? but there are special cases, and they, they use a certain type of biochemistry to get by. Atmospheric pollutants, 
there are pollutants in the air. Right? Some of them are uh, dissolved in the air with uh, extra gases, like uh, when, a, when a cow belches, it's methane. Or um, when uh, we, we strike oil, then there's usually some gas along with it that we kind of vent off. Um, other pollutants, CO2 is not a pollutant. EPA has been trying to make CO2 a pollutant for years. Fortunately, we've got some sane people in Congress that say, uh -uh, no way. But there are pollutants, especially in large cities. Some of those pollutants are particular that form uh, you know, smog is composed of a number of different things. Some are gases, some are particulate. But there are pollutants. And the worst polluters are in the developing world, like China. Um, that's just because Man caused global warming is a myth. I'll have to get up on my soapbox one day if we have enough time, but not enough time. So, how do we describe a gas? Four factors are needed to describe a gas and any changes that it undergoes, behaviors. Right? One is pressure, we make it with a P. The other is uh, let's see, volume, temperature, and N stands for the amount of, the number of moles of the gas, little n. Okay? So, <clears throat> if we know these four factors, <coughs> we have access <coughs> to all of the relevant gas laws to describe the behavior of gases. Now, this is uh, physical behavior. Just have a gas and you're going to squeeze it and you're going to expand it and you're going to heat it up whatever it also allows us to describe reactions chemical reactions that involve gases and we'll get to that later but pressure first so um, what are the standard units of pressure the si units of pressure here the pascal Standard unit. We're not going to be using that. <laughs> but I put it up there because it is the accepted international standard unit. And the reason it is is because one pascal uh, is directly convertible into other fundamental units, like uh, mass, uh, area, like that. And the definition will come up here in a second. <clears throat> But this didn't come to much later. <clears throat> Describing the pressure of a gas uh, was first quantified by an instrument that was built by a, an Italian named Torricelli. And we call it the barometer now, the mercury barometer to be exact. So he just, he had a, a vat of mercury. And uh, at this time, let's see, there it is. In uh, 1643, at this time, they had very good glass blowers. They could make uniform diameter tubes of just about any length you want. So he got one that was maybe, oh, a yard, yard and a half long. A meter, meter and a half. And it was closed to one end. And he filled it up with mercury. He had this mercury tube. He had the mercury vat. And he plugged it with his thumb, turned it over, submerged his hand in the mercury. They didn't know about mercury before in those days. Besides, metallic mercury is not that dangerous. When you convert mercury into organic types, Dimethyl mercury is probably the, the most insidious chemical ever devised. <clears throat> I'll tell you about that later if we have time. 
but it's inverted it. Okay? So we've got a tube here, open at the bottom. Okay. Closed at that end. Oops. There we go. Now what happens? <coughs> he initially had mercury all the way to the end, both ends. But when he took his thumb off, mercury level dropped. But it didn't drop all the way down. Right? If it had a hole in the top, yes, it would drop all the way down. Because the forces on both sides would be equal. But the only force available here is one from the air and two from the mercury inside the tube. And it dropped down to say, maybe there. So everything else in here is mercury. So what do you think that was? It used to have something in it. Now it has nothing in it. What do we call that? It starts with a V. A vacuum. That was the first vacuum they ever made. He may have tried it several times with different wall thickness tubing. We found out that the thinner ones, when this started to happen, the pressure on the outside was too high, he probably broke his tube. He finally settled on one that was thick enough to withstand. Okay, so he reasoned that the only thing holding that column of mercury up was the pressure from air. Right, so this pressure from air was bearing down on that vat of mercury and pushing the tube up. And he noticed that it, it didn't matter what size the vat was, just several different sizes, it didn't matter. Because pressure is a, a uh, intensity factor. Doesn't matter how much it is. Pressure is the same. Right? One way of expressing it is, uh, well, when I was growing up, pounds per square inch. You know, now we have uh, kilograms per square meter, one of those, one of these equals one pascal. <clears throat> okay, so what did Torricelli do with this barometer? Well, he, he played with it. Okay, it was fun. And most of the scientists in these days were independently wealthy. Right? So they had time to do all this stuff. And they weren't even called scientists. They weren't called chemists. They weren't called physicists at this time. They were called natural philosophers. Yeah. Semantics, right? So <clears throat> he put that in the back of his aqua cart or whatever he used to travel around in. And he went up the mountain. Found out as he went up the mountain, the level dropped. So he reasoned that the air was like a column bearing down <coughs> on his mercury. And as he went up the mountain, the column got shorter. In other words, there's less air in it. So it, it could push down on the mercury less. And he measured it by a difference in, in the height. He did the same thing, he went down to the sea level, found that, you know, so once he created this and um, told all his friends about it, uh, they wanted one too. So he sent them all the designs and they had their people build uh, barometers. And then they started to use barometers to measure air pressures. First thing they did was measure weather. They noticed that if you just sit there on the table, there's bad weather coming in, it drops. Once the bad weather passes and the clear weather comes along, so ever since, low pressure has been associated with bad weather, high pressure with good weather. Other thing you can do with it is you can enclose that. Okay. So now there's still air trapped in there, of course, holding this up. But we can take a, a tube and run it over to a reaction vessel. Right? Carry on a reaction, produce gas. 
then you can measure the pressure of the gas in that container here. It's just the difference between what it was and what it is now. So if it, if it moves up like that, that's the pressure in the container, that difference. So chemists were able to measure <coughs> the pressure of products <coughs> that they produce from reactions. Okay. Oh, the other question is, why do you use mercury? It had to be a liquid, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't travel up the tube. If it was a solid, it would just sit there and do nothing. And if it was a gas, it escaped. Right? So it had to be a liquid. So he narrowed it down to liquids, and then he said, all right, what kind of liquids do we have available? Well, uh, water is plentiful. They, they were able at that time to make pure water. They can now be distilled. The trouble with water is, let's see. Density of mercury. Here we go on this slide, right? That must be on the next slide. The density of mercury is considerably higher than water. So what does that mean? If the density of mercury is is a lot higher, um, well, then put it in here. Scratch my head. Let's say. I think mercury is about 13 times more dense than water. Right? So that means <clears throat> if your column here at sea level, from the level of the mercury here to the top there, 760 millimeters mercury, then if you substitute water instead, water is going to rise 13 times as high as that. I mean, they can make long tubes, but that's ridiculous. So one atmosphere will support water to a height of about 33 feet. My wife used to be a scuba diver. Not anymore. I do was with Larry. Uh, this was before we met, and uh, she knew they had charts, right? So they knew how deep they could go and how long they could stay there, and what they had to do when they came up, you know, to avoid bends. Um, but Every 33 feet you go down, add another atmosphere of pressure on it. 33 feet more, so 66 feet. You get two atmospheres in addition to the one that you left on the surface. So that's why you can't stay as long deep, because what inflates your lungs? The high pressure air in your tanks. And if it's fighting a higher pressure as you go deeper, then pretty soon, pressure in the tank is going to be equal to that depth pressure and the deeper you go the sooner you get to that equal equilibrium <clears throat> anyway this is the standard for one atmosphere 760 millimeters of mercury tall is one atmosphere pressure um, another unit of measure Tor, just in honor of Torricelli, we just said one millimeter is one tor. Right? So it says tor, just think millimeters of mercury. Same way. Now, let's see. Back, go back, go back. There it is, normal pressure. <clears throat> like I said before, if you go up into the atmosphere on a mountain or in an airplane, the higher you go, the lower pressure. So at the airport out here, that way, the air pressure is less than one atmosphere because we're about a half a mile high here, so that's less air bearing down on us. That's why when I, on Sundays when I go down to Mount Hope to church, my ears have to pop every time. It's like I'm, my head's in a bucket. So West Virginia is the only place you have to go down the hill to get to a mountain. <laughs> okay, and you can convert, right? We have an equivalence here. 
Right? Anytime you have an equivalence, you've got a conversion factor. Right? So if you divide by, say, 760 millimeters of mercury on both sides, right? that's a valid algebraic expression, divide both sides by the same thing, then this becomes 1. And now you have this expression equal to 1, and you can plug it into any conversion. Right? If you want to get rid of millimeters of mercury, say you have a value over here of uh, millimeters of mercury, and you want in atmospheres, numerator, denominator, answer. Just divide 760 into that value, you get atmospheres. Okay. Okay. So, what are we going to do with the barometer? Those examples of conversions. Okay. Winter place is even higher. I think it's even higher than the winter place returns. Now, uh, South Pier, is that winter place? Or is that snowshoe? Which one's northeast of here? Remember? I think it's the one like on your way towards Princeton and Snowshoe River. That's snowshoe. Okay, that's snowshoe. Mm -hmm. Winter place then uh, uh, same person. is high because snowshoes. A little over 3,200 feet. I can run the fast one. <laughs> but the pressure is going to be lower because okay. it's higher in elevation. And in fact, the um, barometric altimeter is a device you will find in every plane. Even though the airplanes have GPS now, the newer ones. A retrofitted ones, <coughs> which tell you where you are on the surface. Uh, in this way, like that, pretty good. The barometric altimeter is more accurate than GPS for your altitude. All you have to do is when you when you land at an airport, reset your altimeter to the local uh, elevation air pressure combination, and your your altimeter is recalibrated. And you're good to go. Oh. Okay, that's the way it is. Must have got kicked off and came back on. Okay. Okay, so um oh you know what? I told you wrong. Why? Because kilogram is a mass, it's not a force. So we need a force. One newton. One newton is a force. Now what is newton equal to? Well, all you need is newton's second law. Okay. So the force of one newton just uses fundamental mass, one kilogram, and the acceleration of one meter per second squared. So a newton is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared. You don't have to remember that. I'm just illustrating. The SI system insists upon convertibility, like inner conversion of their measurements. In fact, the Pascal is derived. The Newton is derived. So the Pascal has to be derived. The kilogram is fundamental. The meter is fundamental. The second is fundamental. Okay. Everything else up here is derived. <clears throat> Other ways of expressing because there's one atmosphere. Also, one atmosphere is equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. So to get that, all you have to do is convert millimeters of mercury conversion factor, right? 
So millimeters of mercury here, inches of mercury there. What's the relationship? One inch equals 25.4 millimeters. Slide that into that, and that should give you 2992. Okay. <coughs> Pounds per square inch. <coughs> One bar equals this many pascals. The only time I've ever used bar is in my freeze dryer that we had at another lab. And it would pull a vacuum on objects that we put in the freezer and stick them in there. Close the door, pull a vacuum down to about 10 millibar. It's a pretty good vacuum, not perfect, pretty good. And that low pressure allowed water, the solid ice, water in our samples sublimate. It would just go straight to gas. And when it did that, it passed through the membranes without damaging it. And so we had undamaged cellular matter without broken cells. And that way it would keep longer. And we just put it in our low temperature freezer at minus 100 or 95 degrees centigrade. Keep our samples for a long time. Of course, you have to freeze them fast too. Right? The slower you freeze, the bigger the crystal. If you, if you freeze the sample really slow, like stick it in the freezer at home, it'll grow huge crystals, punch through all the cell walls. That's why stuff you put in your freezer at home only keeps a certain amount of time before it starts freezer burning. But if you can freeze it fast, you can make very, very, very small crystals that are smaller than the size of the cell. So we would freeze our samples in liquid nitrogen, minus 195 centigrade. Don't come in that, freeze them hard as a rock, and then we would uh, stick them in the freezer and, and hold them until we could put them in the freeze dryer. And then once you got them dried, and, and we stick them to a grinder, store them in a labeled bottle, and you can put them on the shelf then, or stick them in the freezer if you want. Anyway. That's the bar. Millibar, okay. I think uh, some weather maps use millibars. Right? They kind of mix their units. Millibar for the metric system and degrees Fahrenheit from the from the uh, imperial system. <coughs> so this is just an exercise in conversion. Oh, by the way. Uh, if we have to do a lab where we need to know the air pressure, we have a barometer in the lab. It's not a mercury barometer. No. Got a little diaphragm in it. It measures the air pressure and it gives the value in inches of mercury. So if you're going to use those values, you convert them to atmospheres. Once we get to Boyle's Law, that's a couple of exercises down the road. Okay. That's a chain conversion. Inches of mercury. There's another conversion. Another bar. Okay. So, uh, let's see. That's another chain conversion. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. Um, what's the pressure of, of uh, mercury? 760 millimeters high, about 5 millimeter diameter. 5 millimeter diameter is a cubic tube diameter. So these are just conversions. Okay, this is more important. Start getting into our gas laws. Oh, I'm talking too long. Right. <coughs> Boyle's law. <coughs> so Boyle's law addresses the relationship between pressure and volume. Okay. <coughs> and 
And if you're if you're going to investigate variables, these two variables, these two have to be constant. You can't change them. The number of moles trapped in your vessel and its temperature has to be constant. So that you can let these two vary. Otherwise, you don't know what has the effect yet. So what Robert Boyle did was he he took a, a J two he called it like this, sort of a modified version of Torricelli barometer. Took a J two, this, closed at that end. There we go. Then he started putting mercury in there. <clears throat> At first, it just puddles on the bottom here. Right? And he added a little more and a little more and a little more. Eventually, puffs in the inner curve. When he did that, it traps the gas in here. Now we have a, a fixed amount of gas, and he maintained the temperature either. I don't know, maybe you had a, a cellar, a wine cellar, they're pretty consistent. Or he just submerged it in an ice bath. That would constant temperature. But whatever he did, as he kept adding mercury, mercury would rise and get more mercury up here. Right? And the mercury would rise up here, but it wouldn't go as high as that one. Like that. Why is that? Why didn't it go to the same level? It's not a trick question. If this is not, if this weight is bearing down and pushing on that one, and it's not the same level, something has to be pushing back. Right? The, the trapped air pushing back. So he measured the, the pressure on that trapped air as the difference between here and here. So that's one pressure value of millimeters of mercury. And of course, since this is open, there's added pressure here. So he had to he had to take this value and add it to atmosphere and get the true value for the pressure on that gas. <clears throat> okay. So what he noticed was as he plotted these out. He would get uh, a pressure here. This is an atmosphere, but it works for millimeters of mercury or any of the pressure measurements that matter. And this is our volume in liters. This is just a hypothetical table. If you multiply the two together, it gets this value. Then he adds a little more mercury, right? He gets and multiplies the, together with the volume now, the new volume. Actually, we're going backwards. I'm sorry. Oops. That's not what I wanted. Okay, so actually we're going this way up. So we start off with this pressure and that volume, and then we add more, and the volume keeps decreasing. Notice that they're inversely related. Increase the pressure, decrease the volume. And that's characteristic of the expression P times V equals a constant. If P times V equals a constant, we don't change the number of moles, we don't change the temperature. And this will always be a constant. That's Boyle's law. When he plotted them, he noticed he got a curve. Right? And another way you can detect inverse relationship is if the scale on the x and the y-axis both increase like this, increase that way, increase this way. And you get this trace, a curve, <coughs> doesn't have to be a straight line. That's an inverse relationship. It's actually mathematically, it's a hyperbola. Because no matter how high you go in pressure or how high you go in volume, that curve will never touch the axes. That's characteristic of a hyperbola. <coughs> <coughs> so, 
if we know what the constant is and we know what one of these is, you can solve for the other one. But that's not very convenient, right? Under these conditions, say conditions one, you have a pressure body equals to a value. If you change one of these values, then the other one's going to change to maintain that constant, right? So the new pressure times volume is going to be equal to that same value. Right? So the cumulative law says if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. Right? So this form here is the more useful form. Right? This is what I call before and after. If you know these two values before, and then you change the pressure to this one, you can find out what B is. You solve for the unknown. Okay. The other thing with Boyle's law, since <clears throat> scientists hate curves, it's, it's really very difficult to deal with curves unless you absolutely have to. It's simpler if you can transform your data so that the plot will give you a straight line. If you haven't lost your data, still there. But if we transform, let's do it this way. There's your constant. What if we divide both sides through by B? B. B. Now we get P equals, these cancel. P equals K over B. And we factor out one over B. We have the first part of a straight line. Remember, Y equals M X plus B. In this case, B is equal to zero. It goes through the origin. So we can, it's just not there. <clears throat> but if you plot one over B, against pressure, then you get a straight line, positive. And we'll do that when you get foil flaw data, plot both ways, improve it. Now these units are going to be, say volume is in liters, right? Units are going to be liters to the minus one. Right? Minus one, Exponent is a way of saying the inverse of. So the inverse of volume is u to the minus one. This one hadn't changed. Let's just say it's at liters. Now <coughs> the slope is equal to your k. Right? Rise over run. And if you, uh, once you get your straight line drawn, you can pick any pressure in here, where it meets, come over here. So there you have that one over V, I don't know what it is. So this is uh, V2, and this is one over V2. So now at that pressure, you can find out what your one over V2 is, and then you just take the inverse of it, and that gives you one. Okay. That's Boyle's law. <clears throat> Looks like I'm going to have to keep talking after we run out of time. I'm used to it. Okay, so that's before and after. Um, and this is an expression of that. So if you have values, what you need to do when you see a problem like this, decide what's the variable. Pressure varies, volume varies, good. If you know, if you're given information like what is it before? Uh, is, uh, final volume of a gas from 15 liters of gas at 500 millimeters mercury. That's the initial condition. Suffers a pressure drop to 125. That's P2. That's V1, V2, P2. Now we can solve for zero. But 
if you put them up here like this, and fill in the information before you try to stick it in your formula, then you won't make a mistake. But if you try to go straight from the word problem to the formula, half the time you get it wrong. And the way multiple choice tests are made up is, I say, what are common errors that students make? Let's do them and see what the answer is. Put that into multiple choice. That's so, just because you see it in there as the answer, doesn't mean it's the answer. Right? You got to know what you're doing to find the right answer. <coughs> okay. And you can notice also <coughs> that we can use any pressure measure we want to <coughs> because the pressure is canceled. And that little L should be a big L for leaders. And with a ratio like this, you can use any units of pressure and volume that you want. Because it's a ratio, it'll cancel. Okay. So there is another problem. Um, we're solving for pressure there. Okay, what's next? That was boils, pressure body. Then along comes a French with Charles in the next century. Uh, here, 1787. So it's over 100 years later. Why did it take him so long to get around to, to looking at gases relative to temperature? Because they didn't have a thermometer. They didn't have a reliable way of measuring temperature. They could describe it. <clears throat> but they couldn't measure it. So somebody had to, had to invent a thermometer. They tried various things. Some just as ludicrous as the others. Eventually we settled on mercury thermometer. We can't use it anymore, of course. EPA and OSHA says we can't have it. I have some stashed away for posterity. <clears throat> but <clears throat> once um, Charles had a, a working thermometer, then he could, he could test the relationship of temperature and volume. And these would have to be constant. Pressure in moles. So how do you do that? Well, one way you can do that. You have a cylinder and you put a piston in it. Once the piston's in there, the gas trapped is fixed moles. No more, you can't put any more in there. And then you maybe put a weight on it on this piston. Maybe just for argument's sake, one kilogram. And it stops when the pressure inside equals the pressure on the outside. Right? So now we have a constant pressure, a constant number of moles, and now you vary the temperature. Right? So you can put it in a some type of a, a bath. and vary the temperature of the water or whatever you use to heat it. And measure that temperature, because the temperature out here, once it reaches equilibrium, the temperature out here is the same as in here. Right? So you watch the temperature change, and when the temperature goes up, you notice that the piston went up. And the, the cylinder was calibrated, so all you had to do was measure the height, multiply by a factor, and you get the volume. So when Charles plotted his data, volume versus temperature, he noticed that he got a straight line. No conversion needed. This straight line has a positive slope, which means as the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. That's a direct proportion relationship. So Charles' law, is um, volume over temperature equals a constant. And that's characteristic. Anytime you see before the boils, if you see P times D equals constant, that's an indirect proportion, or inverse proportion, excuse me, inverse proportion when the variables multiplied by each other equals constant. 
That's the inverse. If they're a quotient, that's the rank. So, <clears throat> Charles wasn't the only one <coughs> interested in temperature volume relationships of gases. Lots of other people were. And one of them went by the name of Lord Kelvin. And he said, okay, I've got all this data that's been published by other people, and I've done some of my own experiments. What if, after I plot here, I just take that line and keep extending it? So what's he aiming for? It's getting colder and colder, right? Way out here. Plus, the volume is decreasing. So at some point, theoretically, you're going to reach a place out here where the volume decreases to zero. Right? And in an ideal gas, that happens. The volume just goes away. But real gases don't do that. However, when you did that, here we go. There's your scale. When he extended the scale out here to zero volume, he found that theoretically that would happen at minus 273 degrees centigrade. So he said, all right, this is great. I can set up a new temperature scale, name it after myself, with a big K. And the great thing about it is, on my scale, there are no negative numbers because I'm starting from absolute zero. Right? So Charles' law requires that this be an absolute temperature scale. And our choice is Kelvin. Not degrees Kelvin, just K. Degrees centigrade, degrees Fahrenheit, yes but only K for, temp for absolute temperature. Okay. So you can do the same transformation with this one. Oh, excuse me. Let me go on. Right. What did I do wrong? I wrote it wrong. It's V divided by T. Okay, <clears throat> so if you plot V times T, uh, V against T, V equals K, T. And so there's your straight line. Don't have to change anything. Just plot volume temperature, you get a straight line with a slope equal to K. And if we take this one and set it equal to this one before and after, you get the same situation. That's equal to that before and after Charles' law. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. How much time do I actually have? Okay. I'm not going to finish. So if you guys have to go, <coughs> oh, you're going you're gonna to need to take that exam. So you can take it in here, but I might be distracting. So we'll put you in another room, maybe. Okay. okay. Well, that's Charles' law. And the only stipulation in Charles' law is you can use any volume measurement you want, but the temperature has to be in absolute terms. And for us, that's Kelvin. There are other absolute temperature systems, but we're not using them. Just Kelvin, because it's so simple. If you want to find out Kelvin from your centigrade, degree centigrade plus two degrees. That's Kelvin. Okay? So whenever you do temperature calculations in this class, always convert to Kelvin. If the temperature is given in Fahrenheit, then you got to convert to centigrade first. Remember that? One? We did that one at the beginning of the lecture, didn't we? Right? Fahrenheit equals nine fifths C plus 32. So if you need C, you just plug that one in there and then solve for C. And then add your 273, and you've got Kelvin. I'm going to take a short break. Right back, momentarily.
I'm not going to pause because I'm scared. Sorry about that. So picking up where we left off, um, the only unit you need to change is to make sure that temperature is in absolute terms. Volume can be anything. Okay. There's an example right, where we had to, we had to convert 25 um, equals 290. 300 equals 573. So we have before and after temperature, but we only have uh, 50 liters of gas before. Watch the wording. Calculate the final burning volume of the gas when 50 liters of the gas at this temperature are heated. Okay. We've done all our thinking. And there should be a, either a parentheses or a dot right in here to show this times that. Okay, there's another example. It's like any equation. If you know everything but one variable you can solve for. Now the last one we're going to consider. Uh, came a little bit later and is attributed to Avogadro. So Avogadro wanted to describe things in terms of volume and mole. So that's constant, that's constant. Temperature and pressure have to be constant. Volume both, that can vary. In this one, we also have a direct proportion. that. Yeah, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to skip the discussion of Carl Drucon's interesting story, but we don't have time for it. <clears throat> so in this case, the before and after equation would be before and after. Yeah. We need, um, if we actually have everything we need on the before, and then 
only one on the after, and it'd be fill in that one, fill in that one, and fill in whichever one we saw for the unknown. Now, oh, um, here's application to stoichiometry. We're not just doing these gases for fun. <coughs> All over the you know, right? The, um, let's see. Okay, so for this reaction, we're decomposing ammonia into nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. It's already balanced. So we know that two, two equivalents or two moles of ammonia on this side yield how many moles of product? Four. Right. One of this one, three of that. That's what those prefixes, those coefficients mean, is moles of something. So these are all gases. That means we, we use gas law. You don't have to have all gases, but in this case they are. So if we substitute into the equation here, let's see, we want to find out, um, calculate the volume afterward. So we're looking at this equation right here. This is the initial pressure, uh, no volume, excuse me, the initial volume of ammonia, because that's all there was right, before it decomposed. That's everything that's there was only ammonia in the beginning. Right? And this is the final number of moles, four, and this is the um, beginning, the initial number of moles. Now we can find out what's the volume after the reaction. 70 cubic feet. So we went from um, here, two moles of that, four moles of this. That makes sense. Right? If you double the number of moles, you should double the volume. That's assuming all of the ammonia decomposes. You don't have anything left over. Then you went from two to four. And that difference, that ratio is double. So we double the volume. Okay. Now the combined gas law. This is useful sometimes. We're going to take the three gas laws and put them together. <coughs> Combined gas law. This is still before or after, right? If you know conditions uh, for, like you know, this one, this one, this one, this one, and they all change in the after, except uh, you want to determine what this one is. And we can write a law that incorporates all those variables and solve for the unknown. So we look at it this way, before and after. Right? So P times V equals P2. There. What's the relationship of volume to moles? Like that, right? to quotient. Still a quotient on this side. And the only one we got left is temperature. So the, the relationship to Charles' law is volume to temperature. There's your combined gas law. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if we hold the uh, temperature constant and let the other three vary, then this one is the same as that one. And when we solve, it comes up over here, cancels out. <coughs> so any, <coughs> any values that are constant, they factor out. You can just ignore them. But if all four of them are changing, then you can only solve for a one. Then we know this one, this one, this one, this one, and we know that one, that one, that one, solve for this one. You have to have one unknown only. To solve a single equation, right. yeah, anybody had algebra? Yeah. So you know if you've got two equations, if you've got two unknowns, you got to have two equations. 
that are related to one another, then you can solve for both of them. Uh, we don't do that in this class. <laughs> we, can, we only have one that uh, is unknown to the solve for. So that's the combined gas law. So up to this point, we've been talking about before after. If you know the conditions before, and you know changes to something else, then you can solve for the unknown. But suppose you're, giving, you're given a, a state function, a state situation, where you only know this is it right now. I don't know what it was then, I don't know what it's gonna be here, just now. We need a different equation. The ideal gas equation. And what we do is, we take the combined law, P1, V1 over P1, N1, that's gonna be equal to a constant, right? Because each one of these are related to one another in a constant. This constant is the combination of constants for all of them, right? So you can't derive this from any one of these. It's a new constant, okay? It's a special constant. In fact, Given an R. R is the universal gas constant. Now, that's kind of a misnomer because it depends on the units. Right. So, what would we do? <clears throat> what would the units of R be if this were in atmospheres, this were in liters, this was in K, and this was in moles? <clears throat> these units on this side, not just the numbers, the units have to be the same on both sides too. You've got to have the same units here as here because it says they're equal. They're not just number equal, they're unit equal. So the units of this one are liter atmospheres per mole of A. You change any one of these, then you got different units over there and you need a different R value. Okay, so the one we're going to use in this chapter is equal to 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole. Okay, and that's in your useful information at the back of your uh, review document. It's in there. In fact, several others are in there. So find this one so you can you can eagle it when you need it. <clears throat> okay. So that's the combined laws. Ideal gas law. Okay, normally the ideal gas law is written not as this way, but take that out. And we're gonna put these two on that side. So we just divide both, um, multiply both sides by T1 and N1. Where T1. Okay. Multiply both sides and get rid of this one. Puts it over there. So now we have PV equals NR. That's the ideal gas equation. <clears throat> and if all you know, if you know three of these variables, Three of the four, you can solve for the fourth one because that's a constant. Okay, so you don't need to know before and after in this case. Okay, so we've gone through before and after equations, and now we've got the ideal gas equation, which is state function right now. Okay, what's an ideal gas? How am I doing? Four minutes in it. Or am I over already? Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. I'll go as far as I can with everybody in the room and then we'll, we'll pause and let you go and I'll finish. I want to finish this one because I think the, the one I, that I have in there already from last spring wasn't using exclusively black markers. So it might be hard to see. So. I'm, I decided that black shows up really well, so I'm going to use black and nothing else. <clears throat> okay, so what's an 
some ideal gas, and we're going to uh, contrast that with real gases. Ideal gases, they remain gases at any pressure and temperature conditions. That's what Kelvin assumed. So they re remain a gas until their volume decreases to zero. We know that's not true, right? You ever used dry ice before? You know what dry ice is. It's solid carbon dioxide. Take carbon dioxide, squeeze it, cool it, and you get solid brick carbon dioxide. The nice thing about it is it's minus 78.5 degrees centigrade. It's pretty cold, but it sublimates. It turns into a gas. So you can ship things with it and they won't get wet. Um, so that's a real gas. This is an ideal gas. They have point molecular volume. What does that mean? Remember in math, you could have, they have to draw the distinction between a point, oh, excuse me, a point, a line, a rectangle of some kind, and see which way it's going. <coughs> <coughs> this has three dimensions. This has two dimensions, right? This has one dimension, right? This has no dimension. <laughs> it's just a point. Right? Points don't have dimensions. So we're assuming that the gases behave as if they were point volume. That is, they have the volume. They don't interact with other gases in there simply. Either they're neighbors of the same gas or any other gases that are placed in there in the uh, time. And they obey all the gas laws. Okay. Now that's true. They will, under certain conditions, obey all the gas laws. And those conditions are uh, high temperature low pressure. Under high temperature, low pressure, a real gas will behave as an ideal gas. Now these are relative terms, so we have to say, all right, what's high temperature? Well, high temperature is relative to absolute zero. Right? So if this room is 25 degrees centigrade, two ninety eight K, that's pretty high. So gases at room temperature behave ideally. Low pressure. Low pressure compared to what? Well, compared to 100 psi. <coughs> so, uh, or 100 atmospheres. So, one atmosphere is considered low pressure. Okay? Or anything lower. You can even go a little higher if you want. And then behave. Now, how do we know that? Because Boyle conducted his experiment at one atmosphere and then he increased pressure by adding more mercury to his J2. So it increased the pressure, increased the pressure, and it kept going up. But he still got that relationship of P times V equals constant. So we know above one atmosphere, you're still pretty good. Okay. Am I out of time yet? Probably. So I'm going to pause it now, and anybody zoomed in, if you have to go, um, you can go. I'm going to pause it now so the rest of the class can do what they need to do, and uh, I'll be back with you shortly. You can still see the room, but I'm not recording yet. I'm going to pause. Okay, we're back. Now, um, I just described what an ideal gas is. Now we're going to look, take a look at real gases. We know what the ideal gas is like. Now we're going to look at deviations uh, or real gases. I mentioned one earlier. If you cool a gas and compress it far enough, it will liquefy. And in some cases, it'll even turn into a solid. 
So that's real behavior. The point volume assumption is false. Real gases actually do have volumes, either atomic volumes or molecular volumes. So they occupy space, it's just that they occupy such small space in relationship to their <coughs> distance to the next molecule <coughs> that it usually doesn't matter. This is the kicker. Gases do interact. Now some of them interact such a small amount that they effectively behave like billiard balls. But uh, many gases do interact with one another. When they smash into each other, uh, they will either attract or repel. And that depends on several factors that we will get into later. But both can happen, either attraction or repulsion. And that uh, presents a deviation from the ideal gas behavior. They interact with the walls of the container. Right? They smack into the walls and they bounce off and they smack into other molecules and then they go over here and smack into that wall. Why do we know that? Because we can measure the pressure inside the vessel with a probe that has a little diaphragm in it. And whenever a molecule strikes it, or actually thousands of molecules strike it per second, per millisecond, that can register as a pressure in the vessel. So we know that these gases do interact with the walls of the container. <coughs> um, as I mentioned earlier, most gases behave ideally if the pressure is low and the temperature is high. Um, atmospheric pressure, standard pressure, and room temperature are considered uh, low in the case of pressure and high in the case of temperature. Now, um, see, I was going somewhere with this and I lost my train. Uh, I'll think of it later. So here's the ideal gas equation. And it was first uh, proposed by Emil Clavaron. Uh, we haven't been introduced to him yet, <clears throat> but you will be. And he said this relationship holds with R being our gas constant. And R changes units, I mean changes uh, the value of the measure, the number, if you will, based on the units that are required. So if you're going to use that equation, then you better know what the units are here. Liter, atmospheres, per mole, K. That means temperature has to be in Kelvin, pressure has to be in atmospheres, volume in liters, and uh, amount of gas in moles. Then you can use that particular value. If these units do not match the units that you have available to you for PV, R, PV, and NT, then you better convert them first. So here are the two most common ones. We're going to use this one first in our uh, in this chapter on gases, and then later when we uh, actually later in this chapter we look at uh, are in different units. And the distinguishing characteristic of this is J is joules. It's an energy value. All right. <clears throat> um, notice also that the temperature is always in absolute units, and that for us is K. So you can't mess with K. If the temperature is in centigrade, you better convert to K. If it's Fahrenheit, convert to centigrade, then convert to K. You can arrange the equation in a bunch of different ways. 
right? Whatever is needed. So we put the, the unknown on this side, and then you fill in all your knowns here and calculate the value. Or you can just PV equals NRT, fill in what you know. As long as you have one unknown, don't forget the constant. As long as you have the R in there and the ones you know, then you can solve for the one that you don't know. Okay. It's a different versions. You can also solve for ratios. If we want to know the ratio of moles to volume, you can set it over here, do that, and that gives you a ratio. Now the ratio is going to be, in this case, if it's N over V, then we're using these units, then the units are going to be mole per liter. <coughs> right? And what is moles per liter? Molarity. This is equal to molarity. So if you want to know the molarity of your gas in the container, then just solve for this ratio. Okay? Now, how did we get R? I just wrote it up on the board. And you use this equation, and you solve for R. Let's put R on this side, over here. And put these over here. PV over NT. Then, if we actually put values in here that we know to be true, then we can calculate what R is. So, what are we going to use? Well, for gases, standard temperature and pressure, standard temperature is zero, oops, excuse me, not K. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius, which means 273 K. Standard pressure is one atmosphere. Okay. So <clears throat> under these conditions, um, N is also going to be standardized at one mole. Okay. So it's pressure, temperature, moles, and volume. Okay, so what's the volume of a gas at that temperature, that pressure, with that many moles? The volume is 22.4 liters in measure. Now, if you put all these values in here for those, you get R equal to 0 0.086 liter atmospheres per mole. Okay, so here we have a, uh, a, a system with two moles of gas at this temperature and that volume. So we have moles here, we have temperature given, we have volume given. And the question is, what's the pressure? This is a state function. This is what it is right now. So you just be sure that you convert. There's moles, there's liters. This one has to be converted to Kelvin. Then you plug in the numbers and solve plus your constant and solve for the pressure. So there we have two moles. Should be a, a parenthesis around this or at times. Then there's our R. There's our temperature being converted. There's your volume all based on this equation, then we solve the pressure. And we have 1.018 atmosphere. This one is looking for moles. So we have volume, we have temperature, which must be converted to K, and we have uh, millimeters of mercury for pressure, right? But we can't use that because pressure is in atmospheres. So we gotta convert, 850 millimeters of mercury into atmospheres. Right. So there's your temperature. Um, let's see. Moles. So 
if we put this one over here, it's PV over RT. So, I uh, see we're converting first. So now we have temperature here, we have uh, pressure there, and we have volume here in the appropriate units already. So now we just solve for moles and plug in the numbers. So we have almost eight moles of gas under these conditions. And for an ideal gas, it doesn't matter what it is. It's going to be that many moles for these conditions, <coughs> no matter what the gas under ideal conditions. <coughs> okay. So now let's consider a reaction. Because the calculations up to now have just been sort of busy work, uh, allowing you to acclimate to this type of reasoning with gases. Now we're going to use the gas law to solve a chemical reaction problem. Notice that this uh, mercury 2 oxide is solid. Right? Its concentration does not change. It's not part. All we need to know is what is this one. So calculate the mass of mercury 2 oxide needed to produce 220 cubic centimeters of oxygen at 25 degrees and 740 degrees mercury. That sounds like a, that's a mouthful, but it's really simple. Right? As long as you have a balanced equation, Telling us that in this volume, in liters, right, we have to convert to liters, and this temperature, which we convert to Kelvin, and that pressure, which we convert to atmosphere, now we can find out how many moles of that there are. Okay? Now, why would we want to know that? Well, the question is how much mass of mercury 2 oxide is required? to produce oxygen under those conditions. So if we know the number of moles here, once you got moles, you can go anywhere in that equation. Can't do it with grams, can't do it with concentration, molarity. You have to do it with pure moles because the relationship here is one mole or two moles. So if we put that information into our equation, we're gonna solve for the number of moles and then we put the values in here that we determined up there, right down here. Oops. There we go. We have uh, 0.0087 by 5 moles of oxygen. What's supposed to fade out? Sorry. Now that we know how many moles. <coughs> We just set up a conversion, right? So this is oxygen. The conversion is oxygen to mercury two oxide. Coefficients there are one, there are two. So it's two times that value. There you go. Now that we know the number of moles of this, so it's so many moles of that. That's what this calculates right here. Moles of mercury 2 oxide. Then we use the molar mass of HGO. You just look up on the periodic table. What's mercury? What's oxygen? There's only one of each. Add them together. Get this value. Grams per mole. <coughs> and this cancels moles 
<coughs> I left out the moles here. But it cancels moles and leaves you with mass. And it takes 1.87 grams of mercury two oxide to decompose and give you oxygen under these conditions. Okay? There it is. The density of mercury is 13.59, which means it's 13.59 times denser than water. That's why Torricelli used mercury instead of water, I think. So this is a, a different problem. What are we doing? Uh, what volume of mercury was produced? So in order to do volume, what we need is the mass of mercury, and then we need the conversion factor of density to find volume, right? Because density equals mass divided by volume, and we're looking for volume, so volume equals mass divided by density. Right. So we got mass on top, we got density on the bottom, and that gives us cubic centimeters here for mercury. Okay. How do we pronounce that guy's name? Well, I'm not going to say what some people do. But in French, it means it's pronounced Dumas. The Dumas method allows us to use the ideal gas equation to calculate the number of moles of gas in a container. So remember, molar mass is uh, mass per unit volume, and in this case, mass is going to be in grams, grams, and volume is going to be in, uh, excuse me, that's not right, uh, molecular weight <clears throat> is mass in grams. Uh, Per mole. Right? So that's in moles. If you weigh the gas under certain conditions as it is a gas, then you find out mass. And while you're doing the experiment, you uh, measure the pressure, the volume of the container that the gas is in, you measure the uh, temperature, pressure. Temperature, pressure, volume, then you can count the number, calculate the number of moles. And then the moles go right there. And you can calculate the molecular weight of a volatile compound this way. <clears throat> so this is a type of problem. We found out the difference in mass for this 250 milliliter flask. That was the weight of the flask before. This is the weight after. So the difference is the weight of the gas that was contained in the flask. We measured the temperature. Right, uh, temperature here, pressure here, and we got the volume. Temperature, pressure, volume. We got the mass of the gas here. So the if um, molecular weight, well, molecular weight equals mass divided by moles. <clears throat> so and the, the equation, the gas equation is this. We can combine those two equations. We just have to find what's the common element between the two, and it turns out to be moles. Right. So if we solve this one for moles, yeah, 
saw the commode. <coughs> we bring moles over on this side, numerator, molecular weight on this side, denominator. So moles equals mass divided by molecular weight. So now we can substitute this one in here. And besides, molecular weight means molar mass. I use it interchangeably. And then we have uh, R and T, still in the numerator. So if we solve for molecular weight, comes over here, the mass R T over T T. So now you can substitute these values in here and solve for molecular weight. And if we do, we find that the molecular weight of this gas is 152.98 grams per mole. Okay. Um, remember when we were doing uh, empirical formulas? Empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio. Simplest whole number ratio of, of number of elements in a compound. But that doesn't tell us what the molecular formula is. In order to do the molecular formula, you need an independent source of calculation that gives you the actual molecular weight. This is one way to do it. If your compound is volatile, say it has a, a boiling point of, say, um, 75 degrees centigrade or less, is a good candidate. <coughs> then you can use the ratio of the two formulas. Remember to find out what that multiplier is. This is not moles. This is a multiplier. So that's one way you can do it. There are a number of ways. But that's one of them. Okay, so let me see where I stand with my slides. Okay. <clears throat> IGE stands for ideal gas equation. So we have to make our conversions. If you automatically convert your centigrade temperature, your Fahrenheit into Kelvin, first thing you do then you won't make that mistake when you try to solve the problem. If you put temperature into a problem and it's not in Kelvin, you will get the wrong answer every time. <coughs> Rearrange your equation to find out what you need to know. <coughs> this is a before and after equation. This was the ideal gas equation. Notice there's no R in this one. If you know before and after, you don't need R. You only need R, the universal gas constant, when you're in a state situation. What is it right now? Okay. In this case, notice that the number of moles before and after were equal, so they canceled out. So here's our decomposition of ammonia again. So if we have 25 cubic feet of ammonia, at this pressure, that temperature, and we heat it from 500 to uh, 
uh, yield to, to 500 from 25, the vessel expands to 30 cubic feet. Then what's the question? Calculate the final pressure. Right? This looks like a before and after. But the thing is, what's happening when we do that heating? We are accelerating the decomposition of ammonia to nitrogen and hydrogen. And our final temperature is 500 degrees. But we don't know what the moles are yet. Right? So we need the ideal gas equation. Well, actually, you could use either one. We don't want to know the final pressure. Right? Uh, calculate the final pressure. If we use this, let's see if we have all the information we need. Initial pressure. There. Initial volume. There. Final moles, initial moles. So how do we do that? Pause for a second. Okay, we're back. All right, <coughs> so how do we calculate initial moles, final moles? In this reaction, remember the coefficients are the molar ratios of reactants and products. So our ratio is all that's needed, the ratio of final to initial. So the final number of moles in a ratio format is four for final number of moles, three plus one. Initial moles is two. So two goes in here, four goes in there. And then the rest, we do have values for them. Substitute them in there. Right? There's four for the gas, two for the, this is uh, after, and this is before moles. And the pressure is going to be very high. Started off at 400 millimeters, which is less than atmospheric pressure. And it jumped up. Three, two, about two and a half times the pressure, which is reasonable, right? Roughly two times. We got four here and two there, so that's to be expected. Except that the temperature changed also. <coughs> Next. Dalton's law of partial pressure. This is the same Dalton that presented to the world his atomic theory. Only that's what everything that he did. He did a lot of other stuff. His law of partial pressure says that the total pressure in any confined gas is equal to the pressure of each of the individual gases in that mixture. So if there's one here and one here, on out however many it takes. These are known as partial pressures. You can add them together, and determine them independently. Or if you know the total and you know everybody else, you can find out what the partial pressure of one of the others is. <clears throat> so if we substitute the ideal gas law, we first we solve it for total pressure. And then each one of these is the solution to, say, this one. You can do that for each one, you just change the subscript on the number of moles. Right? So the temperature stays the same, the volume hasn't changed, the R hasn't changed. So the proportionality of this total is to the number of moles. It's proportional to uh, Na plus N D. <clears throat> it's all dependent 
on the number of moles. As long as you keep those other factors constant, you're good. So if we substitute them there and factor out these, right? Then what do we get? Well, we get this factor. Actually, this will be an equal sign now. Times R T over V. And this is the total number of moles. So what do we mean by mole fraction? Well, if we set this one, that's for argument's sake. Let's say we're not going out to X number. We're just going to stop at three gases. Okay. <clears throat> so now this is the total. That means the number, the total number of moles times R T over V is equal to this expression. And the mole fraction of A is just this one divided by that. Divided by the mole total. And that's a dimensionless number, right? Because moles cancels moles. And it's going to be a fraction, something less than one. And then if you find the mole fraction of each one of these, add them all together, as long as you've accounted for every gas, then your total should be equal to one. And so there's our mole fractions. Add them up, equal one. And as it turns out, the mole fraction Let's see. Uh, the individual pressure here for each one of these is equal to the mole fraction times the total pressure. The mole fraction is also equal to the partial pressure of A divided by the total pressure. <coughs> so if we do that. We have a convenient way to find out what the mole fraction is for a component. All we need is the total pressure and what's the pressure of the component. Or with an equation like this, you only need one unknown you need to solve it. So here's an example. An example chemical reaction. You probably don't recognize it, but uh, let's see, do I tell you what it is? No, I don't tell you what it is. That's nitroglycerin. <clears throat> so when nitroglycerin decomposes, it does so very rapidly. And it goes from four moles of nitroglycerin up to a total of 12, 10, 6, and 1, which is 29 moles. So that rapid increase in pressure from 4 to 29 is what gives it its explosive force. So we can do a calculation here, find out what the pressure is under these conditions, like we did before. And the only thing we have to deduce from the equation is moles of gas after, moles of gas before. The rest is given to us. And it turns out the pressure is almost 300 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so we must have put a very, very small amount in here. Let's see. Really. Well, if it's a 20 millimeters of mercury, that's pretty small pressure. <coughs> <coughs> So it's jumped up from 20 to 297. So we know the total pressure. 
What's the partial pressure of each one of these gases? <coughs> Well, the partial pressure is the ratio of how many moles of each gas you have to the total moles. Right? We showed that earlier. The end of the gas divided by the total is the, is the uh, uh, mole fraction. And the mole fraction is related to the pressure in the same ratio. So if you have a gas that's, uh, uh, let's see, if the pressure is 297 and the mole fraction is 0.1, then the pressure of that gas is going to be 29.8. So there's the ratio of 12 to 29 times that value. This is the pressure, partial pressure of CO2, water, nitrogen, oxygen. So those are four, these four. And the one that contributes the most pressure is the carbon dioxide because it has the largest molar, uh, the coefficient of the group. So if we add those all up together, we should get the original total, 297.59, pretty close. Experimental error. Okay. Everything so far has been a discussion of laws. Now we're gonna propose, and a theory is proposed for why we observe things as they appear in this law. The kinetic molecular theory of gases. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Basic postulates. <clears throat> you know what a postulate is? Those are, those are things that have to be true at the beginning for the rest of the theory to work. So, you have a large number of particles because they're all moving randomly. We need a lot of them. Particle size is small compared to the distance. Yeah, we know that. Gas particles are in constant rapid motion. So when would your gas not be in motion at all? Answer, absolute zero. By the way, we're never gonna get there. Not with any large number of molecules. You might be able to stop one or two molecules in their tracks using a carefully positioned laser. But um, in my opinion, that's sort of cheating. They always collide. All the particles, they, you can never have them sitting there not colliding with something. Collide with each other, collide with the walls of the container. The walls collision is uh, is how we measure pressure. <clears throat> now here's, here's a, a very important statement. The average kinetic energy <coughs> of all the particles in the gas at a given temperature are equal. So if we have a temperature, room temperature, say 293, I think, Kelvin, then the kinetic energy of each of the particles is equal. Right? That's not strictly speaking true. It's really the average kinetic energy. That's what that bar means. Bar means average. The average kinetic energy is fixed at a given temperature. That's what the temperature is. Temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy of all the particles in the sample. And we still have to assume that there, there are no intermolecular react interactions. In other words, all the particles act like billiard balls. So speaking of balls, if we have a uh, bowling ball that weighs five kilograms, we can calculate the kinetic energy of each of these balls using this formula. 1 half mv squared, right? mass times volume. Mass has to be in kilograms, velocity in meters per second. And then you'll get energy in joules. 
So if we have seven balls with um, these different velocities, we can calculate their uh, kinetic energy right here. These are in joules. But we want to know the average kinetic energy, right? So you just average these values, add them together, divide by seven. But what if we average the velocities? If we average the velocities, we get these velocities divided by seven equals 40 meters per second. Right? If we average the uh, kinetic energies of them, we get this value. Now, you see where I'm going with this? If we set this, well, actually, yeah, if we set that equal to this, average kinetic energy, and then we solve, put five kilograms there and solve for velocity, <coughs> the question is, is the velocity equal to this value, or is it different? If these calculations are valid, then it should be the same. We do the calculation, and we find out that in order to get 5,000 joules as an average value, we have to use the velocity of 44.72 meters per second, which is not 40. Okay, so why is that? The reason is that you're only averaging part of the equation. You're only averaging the velocity. And in order to determine the kinetic energy, average kinetic energy, you can't use 40 meters per second. You need to use 44.72. Now, the way we do it is we use a transformation. Right? It's called root mean squared. Square, we need a root mean square velocity. And this is how you calculate it. You take each one of the velocities that we had before, 10, 20, 30, 40, through 70, and uh, square them. Square them first. Then take those squared values, right? You have they're using a symbol called uh, mu or velocity. Then you take those velocities all the way up to 70. After you squared them, right? And so this would be 100, and this would be for, uh, 490. This would be meters squared per second squared. Then you average all those together. Get an average value. But you still got those squares in there. That's not a velocity. So you take the square root of this value. When you take the square root of that value, the velocity, root mean square, is equal to the 44 meter per second that we determined on the previous slide. Now, You may not realize it, but you are not unfamiliar with root mean square. You just don't think about it every day, like somebody like me does. Root mean square is used by everybody who uses alternating current. It comes out of that uh, outlet in the wall. We are told that it's 115 volts AC. But actually what it is, since alternating current is a sine wave, we get voltage here, so it's positive here, negative here, and it goes like that, 60 times a second. So how are you going to calculate a voltage out of that? Well, you can't, because the high is somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, uh, I'm guessing, 140 volts. 
positive down to 140 volts. Thank you. So how do you calculate the usable voltage here? Well, if you take a program that will measure periodically. Every time it takes a measurement here, measurement here, it gets voltages at these time intervals. Then it takes those voltages, squares them, takes the average, and takes the square root, just like we did before, and that gives you 115. And 115 VAC can be used in any of the electricity laws, just as if it were direct current. <clears throat> So, why do we need to know root mean square? Well, we're on the way to determining molecular weight. So the root mean square velocity is equal to this expression. There and this molecular weight, the average molecular weight, <coughs> <coughs> and the R has to be this value with joules in it, eight point three one four five joules per mole k. So what does that tell you? That tells you that if the molecular weight increases, the velocity must decrease. If this increases, it's going to give this whole expression a smaller value. Even with the square root, it would be a smaller value. So that means the kinetic energy for all the molecules in a sample um, is related to both temperature and velocity. So let's see if we can use one. We're going to calculate the average velocity of air at 37 degrees centigrade, which is, well, there's nobody here, so 37 degrees centigrade is body temperature. Okay. So once you take air in your lungs, it's going to have this velocity because it'll rapidly equilibrate with the uh, body temperature. It'll be 37 degrees. So the average molecular weight at that temperature, there's temperature, and we want to find out what the, uh, uh, the no, we're looking for, is that velocity? Yeah, that's velocity. Okay, it should be a, a little v. Right, that's confusing <clears throat> because we've been using big V for volume. Uh, in this case, it's uh, velocity. And it's for air. So that's a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. And how are we going to deal with that? You don't have to deal with them separately. All you need is a weighted average, like we did with these values. Weighted average of nitrogen and oxygen. So you, the mole fraction, the average molecular weight of air is 2902. So nitrogen is 28.02 and oxygen is 32, right? So, since this is only 20%, this is 79%, that's most everything, 99%. <coughs> then the weighted average would be uh, the fractional amount here, 0.2 times that, 0.79 times that, add them together. And you get this value. So we're going to use that value as our molecular weight of air. Okay. So now we want to calculate what's the average velocity at 37 degrees centigrade for air. Right. So we just substitute values in here. Molecular weight of air, there it is. R and T, those are given. Calculate the velocity. There you go. So this is in meters per second, 516 meters per second. 
that doesn't mean anything to me, right? Intuitively speaking. So we convert it to miles per hour. That means something. 1100 miles per hour. At 37 degrees centigrade, that's more than the speed of sound. Not much more, just a little bit. So why isn't there a sonic boom in your chest every second or so? <laughs> that's a dumb question. So if we calculate um, for helium, we find that its velocity is much faster. Right? Instead of 516, it's 1390. So why is that? That's because helium is much, much lighter than either nitrogen or oxygen. So in order to have the same kinetic energy at that temperature, it's got to move faster. <clears throat> okay. So how can we use this information? The lighter gases move faster. The heavier gases move slower. So if you have a, a porous membrane, Here's our membrane. Right, so it's got little holes right here. And we've got a mixture of gases over here. <coughs> Let's just say, for argument's sake, nitrogen, oxygen, and helium. These two are moving much slower than helium. Right? So helium at the same energy is going to impact that sieve, that screen, more frequently than nitrogen and oxygen. It's purely probabilistic. The more times you impact the screen, the more likely you are to get through it. Right? So more helium is going to collect on this side than these two. That's one way to enrich your mixture in helium. Because these guys will pass through the, the membrane. But this one moves faster. So what do you do? Well, when you get to this side, just put another membrane there. Do it again. You just keep doing it over and over and over again. Maybe take a thousand, two thousand times. And you'll eventually enrich helium to the point where it's commercially viable. All right, so Graham took advantage of this uh, concept. The velocity of individual gases at the same temperature to determine the molecular weight of an unknown gas. Right? So here we have another possibility. We had the uh, Dumas method, right, to give you molecular weight. Graham's law of diffusion. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, this is velocity, that's time, and that's distance. So time, velocity times time is distance. Right. Velocity equals distance per unit time. Right. So distance equals velocity times time. That's where that came from. This is equal to that, that's equal to that. That ratio then, we ratio what, what this uh, velocity is equal to for that gas and for that gas. And the ratio then is everything in here, right? 3RT cancels out because we're at the same temperature. So what we get is, <clears throat> by rearrangement, the velocity of A ratioed to the velocity of B is also the same as the distance traveled for A divided by the distance traveled for B. And that is equal to the square root of the molecular weight of the heavier one divided by the molecular weight of the lighter one, in this case. So if we know the molecular weight of one of them, and we measure the distance that they travel in an enclosed space somehow, <clears throat> then we can ratio the distances and plug in our known and solve for our unknown. So let's see, we have a, I think I have a slide with that in here somewhere. All right, this, this slide is showing us uh, an experiment. 
where you have a glass tube and you put hydrochloric acid in one end, just soak it in a cotton ball, stick it in one end of the tube, and at the same time, <coughs> you take a cotton ball soaked in ammonia, stick them in the ends, and then you watch where they meet. The reason you can see where they meet is when, because when they meet, they produce ammonium chloride, solid, and it forms a fog. So you can measure how far did this one move, how far did that one move. And that ratio is this, distance one move divided by distance other move. That's equal to this one from here and this one from here. So in this case, we're working from known values here and giving us the distance. So the distance, the ratio of distance is going to be 1.463, is the ratio of that one to that one. So in order to find actual distances, we need to know the length of the two. So the length, this is the ratio. Say the tube is 150 centimeters. Right? And the distance uh, one of them travels is x, and the distance the other travels is x. So uh, the lighter one, ammonia, is going to move faster. Right? Uh, and this is uh, there we go. Solving for x, and we find that the distance that HCl traveled, we didn't put it up there to say what x is. Now x is not um, mole fraction. X is just an unknown, like any algebraic expression. So apparently we had set x equal to the distance that HCl moves, and then uh, the difference. Let's see, this is HCl. Okay, that's HCl. X, this is HCl. And then the difference then is um, this distance. If we left out a, a factor. Oh, no. No, we didn't. We calculated x, so what's the distance that ammonia moves? It's 150 minus x. Duh. <clears throat> well, there you go. And it forms that fog right here, so you can see it. That's all you need, just a way to visualize it. Now, there's some advanced pieces of equipment that reduce the experimental error. Um, and you can use very small sample sizes and you observe with a microscope lens or a telescope lens if you're far away from it. And this can be used to determine the molar mass of an unknown compound. All you need is uh, to establish that a reaction will occur which will give an indication of where they meet. Okay, so let's see, what's the question here? Uh, after waiting five minutes, a smoke ring appeared at 87 centimeters from ammonia in. Okay, so this is an unknown. The ratio of ammonia to the unknown is equal to the distance that ammonia traveled divided by the difference between 120 and 87.9. Right? So there's the ratio, and that ratio now is equal to the unknown divided by the known for ammonia. So now we can solve for what's the molecular weight. <coughs> and I'm 27.67. <coughs> okay, we well, got 10 minutes, so I gotta move along. Well, the next class comes in. This is just a discussion of the Manhattan Project. Everybody knows what that is, I hope. It was the U.S. Uh, 
the United States effort to uh, harness nuclear energy as a weapon during World War II. And we succeeded and destroyed two cities in the process, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. <clears throat> Hiroshima was destroyed by a bomb that was made out of en enriched uranium in this isotope. This is the one that fissions and gives you the explosive force. So you need to have a certain level of this, and I, I can't remember how much it is. But how do they purify it? Well, nowadays they use ultracentrifuges that rotate at hundreds of thousands of RPM. It's a different principle. But when I lived in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, there was this big plant called K25. It's huge. And they used a diffusion, Graham's Law, to separate these two. U-235 is lighter than U-238. So they just converted uranium to the hexafluoride, which now is a gas. And now they can push it through the membranes one after another, thousands of them. And since this is the lighter one, it becomes more and more enriched each time they go through the membrane. There's not much of a difference here. There's a very, very slight difference. That's why you need so many of them. You also need a material that will not be corroded by the fluoride. Because metal fluorides are notoriously corrosive to, met to other metals like stainless steel even. So about this time, um, DuPont was developing Teflon. So they made their membranes out of Teflon and it is resistant to the corrosion of that uh, compound. Okay. So this is just a point of information. Ideal gases have these characteristics. Real gases have these characteristics. And Van der Waals, who was a scientist uh, back in the 19th century, developed an equation um, for which he received the Nobel Prize in physics. Developed an equation for making adjustments to real gases from their ideal behavior. And all it takes is an adjustment here in pressure so this is, has to be experimentally determined. That's the number of moles, that's the volume. And this is the volume correction. So there's a number of moles and there's another correction factor. So A and B have to be determined experimentally. And once you know them, or you can look them up, then you can make calculations that are much, much closer to the actual behavior of your gas. Okay, that's it. Um, Wednesday we'll have a review and we'll also have a lab that we've missed a couple of times um, on the uh, waters of constitution and hydration. Okay. If you don't have copies, if you missed the test and you didn't come by to pick them up, you better get copies of them and fill out your notebook because I'm going to be checking notebooks just to see. I don't want to see any hard copies on your lab bench, just your notebook. So you better set it up right in your notebook and work from your notebook in the lab. That's it. Bye-bye.